It's, it's really a great pleasure and an honor for me to introduce you to Marcel Levy. Uh, those who have had time to have a look at the program uh, could also could already see, of course, uh, who will be presenting this very important uh, lecture uh, at this annual meeting. So Marcel Levy is a professor of medicine at the University of Amsterdam and president of the executive board of the National Research Council. He is former dean of the medical faculty of the University of Amsterdam, uh, former CEO of Amsterdam University Medical Center, uh, and former CEO of the uh, University College London Hospitals. He is the author or co-author of over 750 scientific publications and a frequent and much appreciated guest in numerous radio and television programs. He is also the author of blogs and columns that are widely read and um, on a very wide range of topics and they're always really worthwhile to, to have a look at. Uh, they're thought-provoking uh, and, and, and very interesting. The range of topics is very wide. Uh, it includes confidence in science, which will be addressed in our second plenary tomorrow. Um, it addresses why patients who are participating in trials should be financially compensated for doing so. And he uh, wrote a column on why ethnic diversity is crucially important, both in medical education and in healthcare. The most recent column that I could find, that I could identify, dates from June the 2nd of this year. And it is entitled, and I translate this now in English for you, say yes to everything. We at HGI are of course very happy that Professor Levy lives up to this motto himself and has said yes to our invitation to deliver the keynote address of our annual meeting. So, with that said, I would like to invite Professor Levy to come to the stage and give him a warm applause. Good morning, everyone, and um, Gertjan, thank you very much for this uh, fantastic introduction. Um, well, it's not that every week starts uh, on uh, such a note, so uh, uh, this is already fantastic, and uh, I'm more than happy also to join you with this uh, uh, at the start of this beautiful conference. Um, I'm going to um, uh, share a few thoughts with you on um, um, uh, healthcare technology assessment and how we can implement this in a culture of, of innovation that we really need in, uh, in healthcare. Uh, I do not have any disclosures, but I do have a disclaimer. I, I'm certainly not an expert in the area of health technology assessment. I'm, I'm an internist and hematologist, practicing clinician, and I did some work in management. So I touch sometimes on the subject of health technology assessment, but I'm certainly not an expert. So this is going to be a little bit a view from the outside in, from the eyes of a practicing physician and somebody who works in a hospital and has been working in a hospital for, for a very long time. I do hope that despite all the talk of not having enough money, not having enough people, not having enough capacity, having lots of trouble, that actually we do live in an era which can be termed the golden age of medicine. And I'm fascinated by everything that happens in medicine almost every day, almost every week, because we never had such an exciting time. It is actually quite nicely reflected in this paper already published a couple of years ago in Science, where there was on the, uh, where they published a figure, and you can see on the x-axis here a, time, a timeline, and on the y-axis a surrogate um, marker for biomedical knowledge. And you can see that this is not a linear line. There are periods in time that the line is steep 
and there are periods in time that not so much is happening in terms of knowledge increment. However, if you look what has happened over the past few decades and is still going on, I think it is fair to say it has never been so exciting in medicine. And wherever you look across any specialism, across any given disease, things get better for patients because we have now so many impulses from the basic sciences, such as molecular genetics, data science, physics, and so forth and so on. And all these innovations and they are then um, uh, translated into better diagnostics and better therapeutic management for our patients. And wherever you look, from rheumatology to transplant medicine, to surgery, to inborn errors, treatment of infectious diseases and even cancer, you see that things are improving every single month. And this is fantastic, and we tend to forget this. And this is actually, by the way, the most important driver of healthcare costs. So that may not be a thing only to be negative about. It is actually a reflection of lots of positive things. And for the very first time in the history of mankind, people live longer because of better medicine. Of course, we do live longer already for decades, but that's mostly due to better social measures, hygiene, public... Uh, innovations and so forth and so on. But now for the past few decades, we do live longer because of better medicine. And demographs have calculated, and that's the dotted part of this slide, that the baby that's born this year or next year has a 50% chance of reaching an age of 100 year. And that's even before we have started to do anything on, on prevention. So this is a success story. And we need to remember this when we talk about healthcare. But of course, like every success story, there are also downsides. And one of the downsides, of course, is that we may not have enough people to deliver all that fantastic healthcare to an aging population that do not die of acute diseases anymore, but survives with chronic diseases. And this is not a national thing or a European thing or a Western world thing. It is almost everywhere in the world. If you look at the shortage of healthcare workers, and although it may vary from region to region, um, but there is hardly any region in the world where there is sufficient healthcare workers for the care that needs to be delivered. It's not that we do not have enough healthcare workers or that we do not educate enough healthcare workers. Actually, healthcare is one of the most intense um, disciplines that we know if you compare it with many, many other economic sectors. So we already employ a lot of people who are delivering care, but we need more every time. So what we need is new mindsets, new ways of thinking. And I'd like to take you back to the beginning of the 20th century when the telephone was invented by Mr. Bell, as you can see here. And at that time in the Western world, people all wanted to have a telephone in their homes. And that looked a little bit like this. And then if you wanted to call someone, you connected to a, an operator who was sitting in a large building, and that operator connected you to another person who also had a telephone in his home. And there were almost every week papers, newspaper publications, and other uh, media outings that if everything was going on the way it was, that at least 35% of the population would end up working as a telephone operator. <laughs> and we all know it didn't happen because there was technology, because there was innovation, and we had automatic operators, and then we had mobile phones. So it did not happen. So actually, by cultivating a culture of innovation in healthcare, but I've added here the word sensible innovation in healthcare, we are probably likely to address this and maybe also many other challenges, such as finance, such as capacity and so forth and so on. And there is ample innovation in healthcare. That's not the problem. It is a very busy, very innovative, very research intensive sector where there are new things that happen all the time. I just give you one example from my time in London. This is Piers Keen, he's working at Moorfields Eye Hospital, and he's an ophthalmologist who's doing retinal scans in patients with diabetes and other vascular diseases. And he actually invented a way in which computers could do his job and did this much better than what the average ophthalmologist can deliver. So this is a typical innovation that's not only an improvement 
in what we can offer to patients, but also makes it less labor intensive and also cost effective in the long run. And this is not only true in ophthalmology. A similar thing happens, for example, in radiotherapy, where the most laborious part of the job, of course, is to make a plan for the patients who need to undergo radiotherapy so that the radioactive beams precisely aim at the tumor and miss essential organs. This is a difficult job, but actually a computer can do it not only a little bit more precise than humans can do this, but also much quicker than any human could ever deliver this. I'm not saying that computers will replace radiotherapists, but with these tools, they can become so much more efficient and effective than they are. And it is everywhere in medicine, it's in pathology. And it's even in the organization of medicine, where based on machine learning, you can predict who is not going to show up for their MRI scan or their operation, so that you can much more efficiently plan your healthcare organization simply based on data that are available in the computer, such as the age of the patient, the diagnosis, the travel distance, the weather outside, and so forth and so on. The issue is that all these innovations come through, but what actually lacks in many instances is the, evalu the proper evaluation of this. Is this really an innovation that's going to help us? Is it really making things quicker, more efficient, and better? And this comparative science, this comparative trials that we actually need, whether this is better than the way we do things conventionally, I think is the big challenge that needs to come. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are here, but how are we going to implement all this? And not everything that we do is actually successful. So for example, in the era of medical decision-making, we have seen many failures. And this is an interesting example. And when IBM Dr. Watson was winning this game, television game, Jeopardy, most people thought, well, this is it. So computers are smarter than humans and are actually better in making decision-making and maybe even medical decision-making. And this has been extensively tested, for example, in oncology, not, believe me, the most difficult part of medicine. And actually was shown to be a disappointment, not enough accuracy, many mistakes when you compared formally the computer medical decision making with medical decision making by a panel of experts. And let's believe that that's the golden, that that's the golden standard here. So there is a problem there. And although this technique has been introduced with much fanfare all over the world, there is actually a little bit of room for that. And it's not only true for that computer system. Similarly, in the UK, the systems that could replace the general practitioner by an app turned out to be quite a disappointment. So innovation, technology is fantastic, but needs an evaluation step to properly see their place in medicine. And there are also another couple of things that we need to take into account. How can we avoid that all these fantastic innovations are actually solutions, but there is no problem that they are solving? And that happens very often. And that is also because we are actually not using technology to replace existing um, procedures or methods in day-to-day in -day medicine. Now we actually add them on top of everything that we already had. So it's great that we do not only have chest X-rays and CT scans, but also now PET scans and SPECT CTs and MRIs, but we add them all up. And even the patient who gets the most sophisticated imaging test in the hospital has very often also had all the other tests that he or she simply didn't need anymore because the final test was the most efficient test. So we need to focus a little bit more on replacement of existing technology by new technology instead of adding them all up um, and doing everything that's available to our patients. And that's not only true in imaging, it's also true in laboratory medicine. Only 20 years ago, in patients with chest pain who had a suspicion of a blocked coronary artery and acute coronary syndrome, we used enzymes coming 
that were liberated and released from damaged myocardial cells. And these tests were rather crude, but then later on we had more specific tests like CKMB and more precise tests like troponin. And now recently we also have heart um, fatty acid binding protein. But it's not that these tests come replacing the other tests. We do everything in every patient. And that will never be an effective and efficient approach because it's quite likely that a single test and omitting all the others is more effective and probably much more efficient and cheap to do. If we evaluate new technology, we have different ways of doing that. And I think the way we do this in, 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 in the world of pharmaceuticals is quite thorough and um, exhaustive. So lots of preclinical testing, and then we have lots of clinical testing in which we establish safety, dose finding, and clinical effectiveness. And even after registration, we do post-marketing surveillance. Well, do we always do that for other than um, pharmaceutical technology, for medical devices and medical new techniques? Well, until recently, not so well. And it's only very recently that we have begun to do these things and that's actually for a very good reason. I'll give you one example. This is a fantastic machine, an operation robot. And if you look at the literature and you look for publications on robotic surgery, you'll find more than 26,000 publications. But if you then filter those publications for randomized controlled trials, comparing robotic surgery with conventional methods, there are only 19 publications, and they're very recent. However, in the meantime, very much, very much longer, before these 19 studies were published, everybody wanted to have a robot for surgery. And not even one in many hospitals, they have three or four robots. And it comes at a price. It's extremely expensive. The disposables are priceless. And I think all over the world, we've spent billions and billions of euros, dollars, or whatever you pay for, for robotic surgery. And there is not a lot of evidence. There is still not a lot of evidence that this is a real improvement for patients. So why do we do this? Well, because we can. Because until recently, except for a CE marking, you didn't need anything just to put the robot in your hospital and let it work. And the surgeons love it, of course. But it has not been a big improvement for patients. So we need also for the, those tracks with devices and equipment and everything else, we need this cycle of health technology assessment. And it's very interesting that the theme of this contrast is not a one-off of health technology assessment. Actually, you need to do this continuously because things can change. And the very best example is, for example, transluminal aortic valve implantation, TAFI which is a fantastic technique in which patients do not need to undergo invasive cardiac surgery, but actually can get a new heart valve through their vessels. But what you can actually see in the past few years, and this is supported by very good research, is that the indication has changed, the patient type has changed, safety has improved, and costs are lower now than they were 10 years ago. So you need continuously to evaluate this technique and to assess for which patients this is useful, for which patients this is cost effectiveness, and this may change over time, in this case, very much for the better. And this is a fantastic illustration that it's not a one-off at market entry or at the decision to reimburse or not. This is something you need to do continuously. There are also, of course, some pitfalls that we need to take into account. And that is that with all these wizardy new technology, these fantastic new machines, these fantastic inventions and innovations, we tend to forget that there is a patient in the center of all of this. And although we say all the time that the patient is in the center of our interests and in everything that we do, we very often tend to forget that patients actually are important, or we lose them in the technology that we are applying to them. So 
I'm very happy to hear that in this conference there is at least a prominent place for patients because we need to listen to them and their preferences and wishes and desires much, can be very, very different from what we as professionals think they wish or desire or want. This all comes through through transformation and transformation is not um, one of the things that we in healthcare is our biggest virtue. We find this really difficult. And why is it difficult to transform? There are many hurdles, and actually the barriers to innovation are not that different from any other sectors. But it seems that in healthcare, it is even more difficult than it was. So it is not only that we do implement new technology without proper evaluation sometimes, but it's also that um, if there is fantastic new technology, we have difficulty in implementing them in day-to-day -day clinical practice. And this is due to the fact that we sometimes have a traditional mindset and a low tolerance for failure and mistakes. Um, and there may be also other issues that actually make it more difficult to introduce new technology properly. So the question you may ask yourself is, who will do this? Who will do this proper evaluation? Who will do this implementation? Who will transform healthcare in the way we need to transform healthcare in the next few decades? Well, that's a difficult question, but I dare to say that nobody on this slide is going to play an important role in that respect. So, we just have to do it ourselves. It is a typical example of professional in the lead where professionals who have a very precise view on feasibility, relevance, and other issues that are important can support true innovations and avoid false innovations. And there are many examples of both. It is a process of continuous monitoring. It's not a one-off. You need to do this every couple of years because things are changing and you cannot rely on information of five or ten years ago. And I think we could already do ourselves a big service by avoiding this at on habit of staggering of technology and stimulate that if we introduce new technology, it should always replace old technology. So having said this, I'm still extremely happy that we do have a culture of technology assessment because I think this brings us a lot of good stuff that we need to get the necessary transformation in healthcare. We can always improve and that's the subject of this conference. And I think that this community, hand in hand with the medical community, is capable of cultivating a culture of sensible innovation in healthcare. Thank you very much.